Enter the Dragon took the world by storm with its 1973 release, becoming one of the highest grossing films of its year, and overnight turned its recently deceased lead, Bruce Lee, into an international superstar. The film launched martial arts to the mainstream and, in the years that followed, influenced works from various mediums, everything from anime to video games. One of the more immediate effects was the sudden wave of martial arts cinema, and those ripples could be felt even outside of the genre. Roughly a year after Enter the Dragon's release, the James Bond series gave the world the man with the golden gun. Stand back, girls. And, more relevant to our interest, that same year, the Ultra series responded with Ultraman Leo. The influence of the martial arts boom on Ultraman Leo can be seen in elements like Gen Otori, the human guise of the titular character, teaching martial arts at the local youth center, and Gen's more refined martial arts-like fighting style compared to the previous heroes. And then there's the nunchucks. <laughs> But Ultraman Leo is also known for its darker nature, and that quality was arguably a reflection of the world itself at the time. The early to mid-70s was marked by a shameful end to the controversial Vietnam War, the game-changing Watergate scandal, a social revolution and rebellion against the establishment, economic instability, unchecked pollution reaching its spoiling point, and the 1973 oil crisis. The latter of which was an especially hard hit on the import-reliant Japan, and the consequences of said crisis took its toll on just about everything, from the production of tokusatsu like Ultraman Leo to sparking panic buying, which led to toilet paper shortages. While Japan would eventually stabilize and go on to become the envy of the world in the decade to come, things at the time were uncertain. Another major factor to the darkness of Ultraman Leo was his own predecessor, Ultraman Taro. Ultraman Taro was designed to win back the younger audiences lost with Ultraman Ace, and it would seem it worked a little too well as, while it did bring back the kids, it drove older audiences away. Now the pendulum would swing to the other extreme. Ultraman Leo is a grittier tale from pretty much frame one, as very early in its first episode, you get... But let's start with the hero, Gen Otori. Gin is a refugee from a vanquished world, and is a good-natured young man who seeks to protect his new home, but he proves far less capable than his predecessors. He loses on a regular basis, and sometimes multiple times, to the same opponents. To make matters worse for him, the series decides to start taking the color timer restriction seriously again, and gives him less time than the other Ultras. Dan, better known as Ultra 7, is not the man he used to be. He is older, injured, jaded, and unable to assume his Ultra form. He now leads Mac, the latest Earth defense team, and takes it upon himself to whip the new hero into shape, literally, as his teaching methods wouldn't seem too out of place in a film like Whiplash. But, in all fairness to Dan, as ruthless as his methods often are at times, he has a point. His options are limited, due to his injuries, the only meaningful assistance he can offer to the fight shortens his lifespan, and, whether due to ineptitude or that the Earth is in the middle of the deadliest wave of kaiju ever, Mac doesn't offer much help. So when a crisis strikes, more is at stake than usual in these shows. There are consequences for failure and inability. Cities are toppled and surrounding characters are made to suffer. Taru, one of the two child companions, witnesses the gruesome murder of his father by an alien and must deal with the PTSD that follows. In the second episode, Gin's romantic interest is left in critical condition after a kaiju attack. These two examples are only the beginning of sorrow. As harsh and as unfair as it is, the fate of the world and those who live in it rest on Gin's shoulders, and he has a lot to learn. <laughs> やめてください。
but no matter how many times he falls or gets slapped, Gen always gets back on his feet to fight another day. Despite the countless cruel and unforgiving circumstances, both within the show as well as the many real world problems that plague the show's production, Ultraman Leo maintains a spirit of resilience and hope. An excellent example of holding on to hope through the dark of the night is given from the start. During the opening fight of episode 1, where the shore is being violently battered by the waves of a killer storm, Ultra 7 fights off two monsters. He puts forth a good effort, though it isn't long before he is overwhelmed and about to lose his life at the hands of alien magma. But at the last second, Ultraman Leo arrives. What follows is a battle sequence that I consider to be one of the best in the Ultra series to date. The triumphant music, the exciting editing and fight choreography, the tasteful hint of comedy in Ultra 7 holding back the twin monsters, and the imagery of two warriors duking it out in the middle of a storm make for a memorable showdown. Although things look grim, a new hope arrived, and while it won't be easy for him either, one must keep the faith and fight on to see things through to the end. Arguably a nice encapsulation of the spirit of the Ultra series itself. Speaking of a underdog protagonist and tough mentor dynamic, Ultraman Leo, or at least its first episodes, seems to have inspired Hideaki Anno's animated directorial debut. Gunbuster, aim for the top. Of course, the 80s OVA series owes far more to aim for the ace, its subtitle alone is an obvious nod to the famous 70s sports anime, but Leo did leave quite an impression. Like Ultraman Leo, Gunbuster has a scene in its first episode where an injured mentor encourages their new student in the setting sun. And like Dan, the mentor in Gunbuster has a no-nonsense attitude and relies on a forearm crutch to get around. Pretty interesting to see the Ultra series still influencing Anno this late in the game. So, I've only made it about 8 episodes into the show, and we'll have to tackle the rest on another occasion, but here are a few other highlights worth mentioning. 1. Ultraman Leo has a preference for serial storytelling over the episodic nature of the previous Ultra shows. 2. As started with Ultraman Taro, the opening sequence showcases live-action footage of the Earth Defense Force vehicles instead of monster or character silhouettes as was done in the past. 3. Yu Fujiki has a supporting role in the show. Within the tokusatsu world, he is likely best known for his comedic roles in Toho epics like King Kong vs. Godzilla and Mothra vs. Godzilla, and the skills he displayed there serve as a nice breather from the intensity of Ultraman Leo. Of course, gruesome things have happened in the Ultra series before, but the bluntness and the frequency of it here makes it stand out, and again, this is how the show starts. There is much more to be said about Ultraman Leo, but that will be saved for another time. This was just a brief introduction to the show and some initial thoughts, but I have some questions for you guys. What do you think of Gin? Is Dan's behavior justified? Which Ultra show thus far has the best first episode or best fight scene? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below. And as always, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again next time. Yeah.